Um, show today is JL70 for people playing along at home. For you on Facebook that are catching up, you type in JL70 in the search box. That'll bring up any items that you see here tonight. It's the top 15 acrylic painting mistakes. There's more than that, but we, we had to limit it to the top 15. So because there are 15, when we get started on this, we are going to go sailing through them at a pretty rapid pace. I'm not gonna go back and try to play catch up if somebody's missed something. Um, every five uh, painting mistakes, we will take questions so that we've got three main question and answer periods. Uh, there's always a little bit of lag for you guys from what I say to when you're seeing it. So I know that that makes a lag for the questions coming in. So um, you can fire your questions away at the gals anytime. We've got Amanda on YouTube. We've got Frida, the moderator for Facebook. They will write those questions down and they can already go ahead and give me those. So if the first thing we talk about, you've got a question about, go ahead and type it then so that they can already have that question waiting for me. So that'll help a little bit with the lag. Um, our, uh, the notes for this episode for JL70 will be put up after the show in our Jerry's Live Facebook group. It is a private Facebook group that you are welcome to um, get into. All you have to do is you apply to it. They will send, it sends you an automatic question. You need to answer it for the moderator to approve you into the group. It's just protection for the rest of the group to make sure nobody's data mining information on, on members. It, it's, I know that part's annoying and it is a little bit, I am not a robot, but you know, you can answer it with, with one word or have fun with it. So, um, but there's over 200 something people who've not answered their questions. So if you're on there and it's not just your friend referring you to it, go ahead and please answer your question so you can be in the group. And again, these notes will be posted as soon as the show is over. I'll run back to my office and post them. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. I think YouTube heard that um, we are going to do this. It's 15 uh, top painting mistakes that acrylic painters make. We're gonna do five questions, five, five of the mistakes, take questions, the next five questions, the next five questions at the end. So, and there's a lot of, I mean, this is, is there's, there's way more than 15 things you can do wrong, but I'm, uh, this show is, is basically designed from the beginner's kind of point on into very early uh, intermediate painting probably. Um, just to give you ideas of the things that could go wrong. And we're gonna go from what I think is the 15th mistake back to the first biggest mistake. So um, anytime that you wanna ask a question, go ahead and put it on there for the girls. I don't, you don't have to wait till the end because of the way the delay works on this. Then your question will already be there. They'll write it down so that they can ask me as soon as we start. So that, is that, is that any better? Let's hope, all right. Okay, since we're using acrylics, I'm I just, putting my You can hear you a lot better on. with the um, microphone on there, but for some reason it's picking up static and I, don't, okay. I can't figure out where it's coming from. Yeah. I tried everything around us. Now so. I'm sure that that's what it is, just because there's There's so many things fans. plugged We've in. We've had crazy rain lately. and Well, and yeah. we have an extra studio in here doing yes. stuff right now. And oh yeah, I didn't think about there's that. There's a lot of things flying through All right. there. Like okay, well, hang tight with us guys. We're we're doing our best. Hopefully this will be a little bit better. All right, so the number 15 painting mistake, choosing the wrong painting substrate. Either it's the wrong priming, it's not archival, it's too cheap, or it's too flimsy for the weight of your material. Acrylics are, I think, I think by some people, some people just expect that you're painting with plastic and it's junk. Acrylics, in my opinion, and, and I do all media, so this isn't like I'm an acrylic painter and I'm saying, hey, acrylics are the best. Acrylics are by far the most versatile medium that's out there for painting. You, there's fluid acrylics that you can use like watercolors. There's mediums you can put in it to make it just like watercolor washes, all the way up from there to even super heavy duty pastes and things with you know glass beads and all of these crazy mix-ins that are in companies' formulas where you can have some great thickness and depth and, and versatility of the medium, 
that no other medium currently has. I mean, you can even put an airbrushing medium into acrylics and use them in an airbrush. So it's just, acrylics can do a whole lot and if you are good with them and you know the right mediums to use, you can, I've had arguments with clients that were like, I didn't want an oil portrait. Why did you paint this in oil? If it's not oil, it's acrylic. You wanted acrylic. No, this is oil. Believe me, it's it's not. So, you know, it's it's it can be, it's a very high quality fine art medium with the right materials and the right know-how. So that starts sometimes with the substrate. Um, there's a lot of people that will use, let's pull this over here. Number one, people are always like, can I paint on an oil prime surface with acrylic? No, no, and that's the other thing. Always oils over acrylics, never the opposite, okay? Acrylics start with A, so they're the first thing that goes on if you're trying to paint with both. Just remember that alphabetically, right? So yeah, if it's O before A with the priming, no, it's not oil. You can't use it. Don't, don't, don't do that. You will, you will get the Amy stink eye and the lecture finger out of it. Slide off. I know. Um, a lot of people start out with uh, canvas paper, right? Okay, that's a great way to maybe experiment some, um, maybe do a color chart because that really doesn't matter, right? Just to see what your color shift is between colors. The problem is that canvas paper is really thin. Um, if you have any weight to your material, um, you, you wet it to thin it at all, you put fluid mediums with it, it can do a lot of curling and buckling because it is just paper that's not weighted, okay? So people think because it's cheap and that's the way to start out, it might be right for certain practice elements or for color charts, not for anything else. So. The canvas pad, just, you need to be aware of that. Then people are like, oh, okay, well, that's fine. Um, how about these great panels, right? Um, they're a paper, you know, canvas on here, and it's a stiff board core, so it's gonna be good. Well, board core can be a buzzword for a number of things. Board core, a lot of times, for lower quality substrates that are for practice can use that buzzword to make you think that this is going to be a better quality. This is cardboard. Cardboard is acidic. It is not archival. This is something you could do crafts on with the kids or just something that's a practice study, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that because it's inexpensive. What if your study turns out fantastic? What if you have people that wanna buy your study? This is not archival. The paper peels very easily off this cardboard surface. It's not something that's going to last somebody more than a year or two, potentially. Don't paint on things that you want it to be a finished artwork when it's not a finished artwork quality material, okay? So that would be the issue with that. I'm just gonna throw these on the floor. Hopefully it's not too, I know. Um, then, okay, so, well, so I need something that's a better board and that's probably canvas, right? So it's not buckling and warping and, sorry, I thought these were actually unwrapped and they're not. So a canvas panel, that makes sense, right? Okay. Canvas panels, it's the same thing because it is turned where it's wrapped around and it's on a board surface and it's got a canvas texture doesn't mean that there might not be a cardboard core in there. Yes, it has a canvas surface, it's got an acrylic priming, so it's going to give you some kind of protection in between the acid surface and your painting, but long-term, this is not gonna work. And I've even seen these, Katie, my grandmother painted on these back in the day, that was all that there was, wrote on them in Sharpie in the back, Oh, would it leak through? Migrated through over two decades. Sharpie does weird things. So it, yeah. they have to be thrown away now. So this is not a, a, never write on the back of your artwork with a Sharpie. I feel like this is going to be a lot of full on archival. Yes. Our hashtag. Kind of well, good. it's just, it's, and it's not even, you don't have, this is great for practice. And these studies can sit around for a while and you can actually enjoy them for a while. But as far as, as you never know how fast you're going to get good at something. 
and you never know when somebody's gonna wanna buy something. So, so, you know, it would be better to avoid this for something, you know, anything other than practice. Ooh, that was loud, okay. Uh, then, so, okay, there are canvas panels that have hardboard in them. Anytime it says hardboard, or it gives uh, like masonite or things like that, that's when you're getting into things that are archival. Uh, that's when you're getting into better quality priming. If the price goes up a little, you know that probably significantly the quality is gonna change. Um, these are Soho canvas panels. They have a, um, a nice fine canvas surface. They've got a board that's very thin but very lightweight. Um, they are acid free. Those are going to be your much better bet. A little bit more expensive than those last ones, but still it's something where you could sell this to somebody then and, and expect that it's going to be around for a while. So that would be the better way to go with something like that. If you just want a lot of something to have lots of painting practice, you don't wanna to have to have room for stretched canvases. You don't wanna to have to have those canvas boards that aren't archival. Nothing says that you can't just get a canvas pad that has so many sheets in it that's nice quality heavy cotton canvas that's got an acrylic priming ready to take the paint and you can always gently pull these off you can mount them to a board with an archival glue after the fact if you want it on a board you can put foam core behind it and frame it flat in the actual frame and it'll support it it's a very inexpensive way of, you have to you say, you've got to just really have to be pocket conscious right now while you're starting this out. Or you'd rather invest more money in better quality paints and have a little bit lesser quality substrate. This is giving you a professional quality substrate just without all the stretchers and things like that at a very low price. So that would be the way to go with that. Um, going from there, then you're looking at stretched canvases. Not all stretched canvases, just because it's a stretched canvas and you know it's it's cotton and it's on you know stretcher strips doesn't mean they're all the same. Practica is a great practice brand. It's a great brand for when you're learning to do maybe some glazing, some things like that where you don't need it to be kind of able to stand up to the heavier weight if you're gonna be using gels and things like that. Um, is it something that you want to have at a 22 by 30 and then be using heavy gels or paste or things like that? No, because cotton, unfortunately, will stretch with weight. So they don't make them super big so that you don't do that and make that mistake. You can go to something heavier duty like the Paramount Pro that's got those deeper, heavier stretcher strips that's got a much heavier primed surface this is gonna be able to stand up to the heavy gels and take the weight of something without making that canvas slack and bow. So do your research on your substrates if you're wanting to you know, just get into it. I know it's boring, I know it's no fun to have to do the research. Read, read, read though. It will save you time, it will ultimately save you money, and it'll make your decisions for doing archival art so much smarter. Yes, Katie, what's wrong? Are we but still having the... It, it's it's very low, but there's still a little bit static. I'm just trying to figure out where it could possibly be coming from. It's not unbearable. Sorry. It's just annoying me because I've been trying yeah, to get this out I right know. for so many... All right. Yeah. It's Sorry. I'm trying, y'all. <laughs> All right. Then there's that camp of people who are like, well, I'll stretch the canvas myself. Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll uh, you know buy unprimed ampersand and I'll pay, you know, prime it myself. I'll do this, I'll do that. There's that camp of people that try to make mediums on their own to save money. This is not the smartest thing to do. Um, I've had so many people contact me before about like things like, okay, so Liquitex makes a, um, a natural sand gel. It's actually, a type of sand, it's impregnated into this gel substance. You can actually get texture out of it. I know I've got it over here. It's on one of those shiny boards. Okay, so 
here's this. So you'll need to zoom in for a minute. Uh, this is from a medium show that we did. With some of these, we actually have done shows on it so you can learn more about acrylics. That is actually the sand gel. You can hear the texture to it, but there's some sheen to it because it's in a nice gloss gel, right? Okay, make yeah, no, that's it. fine. There are people who are like, well, why should I do buy that when I can just buy gloss gel, which is cheaper, and I've got some jars of sand because I've been to the beach. Okay, number one, this is not, this hasn't been treated to take out all the impurities. It's not been washed. It's not been sanitized. Everything is taken out of there, but that little bit of sand that they're using, they're probably uh, sifting it so it's the same particulate size. And then they've got machines that can make it so that that sand is mixed in with that resin absolutely perfectly so it's suspended. So the right amount of resin is actually wrapped around those sand, you know, grains so that it adheres right. Where people always have problems when they make their own mediums like this is they dump it in, they eyeball it, they're using a spoon or stir stick or whatever, and then slapping it on and they will have issues with delamination because it's heavier in some places. It's way too, you know, saturated with the sand. It's way too thick and heavy with the resin in other areas. They're using their own sand, so there's, you know, problems with it stinking or going bad or damaging the resin, actually discoloring it because it's not balanced to be of, you know, an acid level that plays well with the actual medium. So you get people that do that kind of stuff that I've talked to, I don't even know how many times. Then you get people that are like, well, I'm gonna make my own varnish, or they're gonna extend their varnish by adding water, or, I mean, the only time that really this is a good idea ever is, say you've got a gloss varnish, say you've got a matte varnish, and you wanna make your own satin varnish. Even then, you still need to know a lot about what is in the matte to make it matte, so that you don't get those kind of mattish streaks on it. So it's always better just to kind of avoid doing that kind of stuff. Buy it, it's, it's, it's A, less time. More time saved is more painting time, which means you're getting work done faster. You're getting building skills, you're building confidence. You're not taking all this time to fiddle with this stuff. Um, and it's also just, you know it's archival because you know what? They have chemists and people that do this for a living. You don't. So that is uh, number 14. Um, now, we talked about all those mediums um, in JL17 acrylic mediums, what you need and what you don't. We go through all those types of mediums for you and talk about how they apply. And we even you know try some out to see what the differences are between some of them. Um, and then we also did an acrylics medium after party where I think Mikey and I did actually, didn't we make Mikey try all the mediums, Katie? Did we? The glass gels and all, all that, yeah, yeah, we did this. So so that you can actually see how those go on. So it's a great like cheat sheet way of, of trying mediums without buying them and seeing how they do to know what might work out well for you. All right, then the next thing that people do that's number 13, I really wanna put this higher up but, uh, but I'm not, there's other things that are more important because this is just so commonplace, common sense, but people ask it all the time. Gessoing over my painting and starting over. Just, no, <laughs> don't do this. Gesso is not an acrylic medium. Gesso has acrylic resins in it, but it also has things in it like, a lot more pigment and marble dust. It's got things that are meant to absorb that first layer of paint that you're putting on to actually adhere it to the canvas. It's meant to be a barrier for things like oil paint so that the acid doesn't eat through from the oil paint into your substrate. This is not meant to be painted over acrylic paint that is much higher in a resin value where this is much lower in a resin value and then put a higher resin value on top of it. It's like 
making a crap sandwich. Nobody wants to eat it. <laughs> it's never a smart idea, but people for some reason do it all the time because, hey, I've got the bread, what do I put in it? Don't use that. Use a titanium, if you have to have a white surface, use the titanium white and paint over it. Now, if you've got a lower end, you know, lower quality white, it may take two or three coats if it's not the most opaque, but at least it's the same resin. It's going to be stronger. It's going to adhere that bottom painting onto the top painting. If you've already varnished the painting, you need to first make sure that varnish is a removable varnish or find out if it's a non-removable varnish. A non-removable varnish can be painted over with your acrylic paint. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But you just need to, if you know, and you don't have to use white. You can use a different color. If you, you can use burnt sienna, you can use blue, you can use black. It doesn't have to be white unless you want it to be white. Just coat it with something opaque with enough layers where you feel confident and comfortable to start over. All right, uh, number 12, using too much medium or paint. This is something I see a lot of people do and then they're very frustrated and upset because you've got a painting that's got all these kind of lumpy dips and layers and bumps that uh, maybe you just got really excited and you started your underpainting and you're you know, just going to town slapping paint on it whatever the thickness is of the acrylic that you're putting on there, it dries and it dries really quickly if you're painting in thinner layers, you will have brush strokes and brush marks in it. Um, you know, if you're, if you're using gel medium, if you're using, um, you know, anything that's heavier, as heavy or heavier than the actual thickness of your paint, you're gonna start building up texture more. Um, don't do that if you're looking for something smooth. If you're looking for something smooth, stick to just a medium, either a, a you know a gel medium, a, a gloss medium, um, something like that is going to be equal or thinner to the actual paint paint that you're using at the time, so it will be smoother. Paint with softer bristle brushes. Don't paint with something super thick like a hog bristle brush if you're wanting to have much smoother you know, strokes where you don't see the brush marks. It's, we'll talk about brushes in a little bit, but that's something that I see a lot of people do, and then they're upset, especially when they go to varnish, you can see that texture. What's wrong, Katie? Oh, Katie's like, oh. you're I'm still thinking, trying to figure, yeah, aren't you? The gears are turning. Just ignore my face. Smell the smoking. Um, so also, you know, if you're using a lot of these other heavy mediums and stuff, it's taking a lot of color to tint those. Um, it wastes kind of time and money to use those right away if you don't want to do it. Um, all right, using too much white is number eleven. Yeah. I don't. I don't know how many times that somebody goes to mix a color, and they got their, you know, their white over here, and then they've got, you know, let's see, what what color do we want to mix, Frida? Blue. Blue. Okay. Always be blue. The answer is always blue in Frida Land. Heel. <laughs> oh, God. Blue. Copper. <laughs> okay, we're not mixing copper with with an opaque. That, that's not gonna work. All right, so so you, you're trying to make a lighter blue, right, Frida? Is that what we're doing, Frida? Yes. Okay. People see the white and they see their blue and they're like, I'm gonna make a, a lighter blue. So they dig into their blue and then they put it in their white and they mix and they mix and they mix and they mix. And then they're like, uh-oh. Hey, Amy. Yes. Pull the pad closer to you like an inch or two. Okay. All right. Sorry. And then they mix and they're like, but I want it to be lighter than Sorry, that. So then they go over here and they get some more white. And then they add some more white and then Katie knocks things down okay this still isn't any lighter than that already was so I'm gonna push more white into it and this still Frida is this as light as you wanted this yet no 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 it's not okay so look at all this paint we've got we've just wasted two giant things of white 
and we're not any lighter. We're not at that super light baby blue that apparently Frida wants the because she's a blue eyes, freak. Amy. What what are you albino? <laughs> Okay, never if I, I retract that statement. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what you need to do when you're mixing a color and you want to lighten it. Don't mix into the white. Take your color and you mix the white into it. Your yeah, I know, but I for some reason do this and I'm gonna, now that I've used the other end, You don't have to, see how I'm mixing over here to the side and I'm leaving some of the blue? You probably don't need all this unless you're you know, trying to do a whole canvas. Look how that little bit right there just made it that color and I barely used mm -hmm. any white, okay? So always take the color and you can start with less of that color if you need to and start adding your, your light color because white titanium white is very strong that's we did an episode on blacks and whites and we learned that titanium white has incredible strength it is punch you in the face white right where zinc the reason zinc's so popular even though it's not good in other mediums that's fine in acrylic is that it is a transparent more of a transparent semi-transparent white so it's softer it's nice for tinting you don't have this problem as bad but it's, you know, it's it's a different mixing white. So this just used a whole lot of paint, right? Right, 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 it used a lot of paint. I'm a paint waster. Yeah, that's that's too much paint for, for acrylics. With oils, it's fine, because I'll get to that, but with acrylics, no, we've, we've just wasted you a lot of paint. Waste it, yeah. so yes, so that is something that you need to be aware of. What, it's what? Unless it's a good thing we work where we work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, um, now, talking about using mediums, you let's say you do want to, with number 10, you do want to have some peaks and valleys. You want a lot of texture on your canvas. You want this to just be this big, cool, kind of neat thing. Um, so let's take this and we're going to mix. Freda, do we want to stick with the blue or can we go with a different color? Oh, right. How about we don't have teal out here? Oh. Uh, We've got a green, the blue, and the red. Cadbury? Blue purple. Where is it? Where? Where? What is she talking about? There's yellow, red, and something that looks like teal to me. No. This down here? Over here. Over here. Yeah. Yeah. That, no. No. Yeah. Yep. There you go. That's, okay. that's cerulean blue. blue. Oh, it looks that's fine. Familiar. <laughs> it's just another blue. All right, so we want to take this and we want to put this in, uh, we'll say just some gloss heavy. Oh, we've got, let's do this with gel and with modeling paste. All right. Maybe. Ooh. Here, beast, open that for me. Yikes. <laughs> Katie will get it. All right, so two different types of mediums. Paste is white. It will dry white. Gel is clear. Again, there will be the link for the... <laughs> Amanda? Amanda? Amanda got it. it. <laughs> Amanda's the beast. Beast mode. Paste dries white. <laughs> gel dries clear. Okay, we talk about that. Although gel is white while it's still... You know, I better do the paper towels or my dress is going to be white underneath the thing. Okay, now that looks white, but you can tell. Katie, can you zoom in? You can tell that that's, that that's, you know, more translucent. It's gonna be, see, look, that's gonna be clear once it's here. Look, see that? That's clear. This, okay, does that make sense? All right. So we wanna make this this blue color. Now we can do this one of two ways. This is the way that's the acrylic, uh, the top, one of the top acrylic problems. I wanna put this, uh, let's say, really thick sky in my painting. I want a Van Gogh looking sky. So I'm gonna take my cerulean blue that's 
not a teal Look, since there's no green in it. Uh-huh. Okay, so I'm going to put this in here because I don't want to, you know, waste a lot of paint. Hey, while you're mixing, mm -hmm. how does this differ from number 12? It's different. We're talking, the other one we talked about, the texture, like weight of you not wanting the thickness on the actual, I flip-flopped him in my head because I really wasn't reading along with myself. <laughs> so we're still two way. We just, okay. So see how that's pretty close to that. You can see it's slightly lighter because what this has done is this is going to make this more transparent because the more, you know, I add a little bit of color, although this is clear, this will dry lighter because it's got less pigment in it than this does. Now, if I take that same amount and I put it in this paste, No, all the people are like, are you gonna use that paint? Um, like we don't work in our company. Yeah, no. We're sacrificing it for education. My name is Amy and I'm a chronic paint waster. No, I'm not. Um, no, this is educational purpose. This is a, okay, now see how that's actually a much lighter blue than this? Can you see that? Okay, so, I would probably need to add all of this and then it's still not gonna be as dark as this. Mm -mm. So I can keep adding this more and more. What this is gonna do, because this is less viscous, right? Then that paste is gonna be super heavy. It's your heaviest. Is that's gonna make this squishier and squishier and flatter. It's not gonna hold the peaks and valleys as high as when I took it out of the container because I'm adding a thinning agent, although it's pigmented. Yeah. Okay. This is going to be about the same because gels and paint, gels are usually slightly thicker than the actual paint itself. So what do I do if I want this to be these great high peaks, but I want them to be that color? Do I just keep building it up and add another layer and another layer and another layer? You can probably bring the camera up now because I'm not going to, we're not going to mixy mix. What I'm going to tell you is a cheat sheet. <laughs> Don't add the paint to this part add the texture how you want it putting it in all the spots where you want you know cool high texture you can always go over it with another layer paint it after you already have your texture or your gel on there because then you know what you're going to only use that tiny little bit maybe even less if you use something to thin it an acrylic medium to thin it and you're not going to have wasted a whole bunch making the color darker 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 and thinner to paint on or, you know, trowel on, as it were. So you're saving more paint, which means what? You're saving more money, right? You're saving time, you're saving, you know, it took us a while to just mix all that. So if I'm doing that with every color that I'm wanting to do thick, decide, you know, have that drawn out on your surface, kind of how you want your peaks and valleys, put it on and then you can paint it after the fact. So it's something people don't think about and then they go through enormous amounts of paint trying to make it darker, 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 and then sometimes just paint over it again anyway with the color. So this is a way of saving yourself money right from the start with those mediums. Now, that was different, wasn't it, Amanda? I wasn't my question. <laughs> oh, well, I see how you are. Okay, so that's our, first, that's our first three, or our, 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 our third. We've reached the third point. What questions have you guys gotten? Um, have a whole list. I do. Will canvas, paper canvas buckle? Yes, that's what I, I said. That it would wrinkle, it will bow, it will buckle because it's not, it doesn't have a heavy weight and mass to it, right? Um, so only if you're painting in thinned areas or it's fine if you're painting small swatches on for color swatches that's not a problem because it's just small areas. If you're wetting down larger areas, it's going to do that. Amanda. Will painting over the gel make it look less opaque or more opaque? Painting over the gel will make it opaque if you use an opaque color. Because the gel's clearness or lack thereof is irrelevant at that point. So she asked if, if um, painting over the gel would make it less transparent. You, whatever you put over it is going to be your you know your 
transparency, your semi-transparent, your opacity. Definitely. What about using cardboard panels with no canvas? Cardboard panels are still cardboard panels and still have acid. Even if you prime them with gesso, that's just a barrier temporarily. That acid will slowly eat through it. If you've ever taken apart an old artwork in a frame or an old poster uh, that had cardboard behind it and you have that yellow mark around it, that's acid. That's what it does, yes. But what about hardboard is what she asked. H. It depends on if it is actual hardboard like a tempered masonite or it's actually considered just thicker cardboard. That's why you need to read the descriptions when you're buying the materials. And when in doubt, and you look at the tech notes, and you look through all the copy, it doesn't say one way or the other, ask. Or, if you can't get a hold of anybody and the price is significantly lower than one that does say that it's acid-free and that it is hardboard and all that, that right there is probably your answer. You know? Because hashtag dollar signs a lot of time make all the difference in, in what it is, unless it's a really good sale with something like that where you're looking at kind of apples and oranges, they're fruit. Not the same thing. What is the drying time if you use gels or paste to make it thicker to build it up more? And should you let it dry completely before applying? A, a surface of paint? That is a good question. Um, she asked what are the drying times of different gels and pastes and things like that and should you wait until those are completely dry before applying another surface of paint? You're not saying varnish. Paint. You're saying paint. Okay, paint as long as it's dry to the touch and, and when you're pushing down on it it's not indenting it's probably safe to start painting back over again. Uh, so like what I would say, unless you're in just a ridiculously humid environment, uh, like, you know, Florida or the tropics or something where it's super humid and, you know, 98% humidity, if it's a super thick coat, you may need to wait. Touch it gently. If it's leaving a finger, like fingerprint indentation, if you paint very rough or even just like with a little bit, it could potentially tear through that surface, right? Or if it's really jelly underneath, that surface can slide a little bit and could potentially tear around the edges. Consult the manufacturer if you ever have questions on dry time. Golden, and I'm sure Liquitex as well, but Golden's technical information on their website is a godsend. They talk about dry times with acrylics from just regular strain acrylics that are thin slightly with water all the way up to gels and things like that. And I think we were talking for that one show, Katie, weren't we, about that some really thick coats can take up to a year or more yes. to fully cure with acrylics. Nobody ever tells you about that. Curing and drying are two different things. Yes, curing and drying are two absolutely different things. And they talk about when to varnish. So, uh, I mean, just because you don't use Golden doesn't mean you can't use their technical information. So, it's on you to be your own best, you know, support system and guidance and, and, and the only one who has to answer to that artwork and whether it turns out right or not is guess who? You. you can blame it on a whole lot of other people but ultimately it's your artwork. You need to be the one to, I know that part's not fun and it's like being back in school but you know you need to do your due diligence and know what you're using and what kind of products you're using which is why we're here for this kind of stuff because we can help. Amanda. One, is there a way to paint on cardboard and make it last? No. Okay. No. Uh, Amanda asked if there was a way to paint on cardboard and make it last. There is not. Unless you're encasing it in resin or something like that. No. No. It's, it's, it's not, you know. And, and now I will say, you know, think about Picasso and some of the first abstract stuff. He's got newspapers and that stuff. He's got cardboard he's painted on. And all that, that stuff will have an eventual shelf life. It's just in a museum under careful lighting and all that. But eventually that stuff is going to go away. Does it make it any less art? No. But will the value of the art go down when it's gone? Yes. Yes, I mean. Your thoughts on metal panels for, for acrylic? Uh, the aluminum panels aluminum are fantastic. Copper. 
for acrylic. Um, it, I think in one of the acrylic episodes, we talk about painting on the Alumacomp mm -hmm. and um, the old antique car on the website, if you look on our Alumacomp page, it's not here, mm. it's on a show. Um, it is done with just on the aluminum with it um, sanded lightly and it's just straight on the, on the aluminum itself with acrylic. So it's, it's a great surface. Yes. And lastly, MDF. MDF is fine. You do need to put something like a GAC 100 or uh, something like that because what you will have with MDF because if it's, if it's tempered, which means it's sealed, it's got a resin that's impregnated into it, then it's pressed at really high temperatures to make that nice, smooth, hard surface. You will still have some support, what's called SID, support induced discoloration. You put something like a GAC 100, which I know I've got it up here. I thought I had it up here somewhere. Okay. Yeah, I don't know where it went. It was up here for just that conversation. Um, but it, it's, it's a, a sealant that's clear that you put on there. Even if it's like a raw, um, un, un, um, un, what was the word that I just said? No, I, I wasn't able to drink as much of my coffee. It's, if it's not tempered with that resin in it and that glue. I had it out. I don't know where it wandered yeah, off to. Um, then it's it's not going to, it will really need that coat. And then you can put any um, gesso or any other priming on top of it after that, but it has to have that seal first. And I would do two or th to three of them. And on Ampersand's website, they talk about that. And I think we actually have a PDF that's linked to that on the um, just unprimed Ampersand on our site that talks about how to seal that properly. Where did I put it? On the cart with the other stuff. <laughs> For the frames. Never, never be without it. I usually have one about everywhere, don't I, Katie? Yes, Frida. I have several questions. Okay. Can you paint on watercolor paper with acrylic? You can paint on watercolor paper. No special priming required. What about painting on wood? Now, they didn't specify if they meant panels or if they meant live edge wood. We're or... back to this again. Yeah. Even if you're painting on panels that uh, that have a gesso, gesso already on them, but they've got the cradled sides and you're wanting to wrap that painting around the side, or heck, even if you're wanting to paint it black on the outside of it, you still need to put this on. Have you ever um, seen, especially farmhouses or places like that, where they just painted right over the top of knots or um, like if it's pine where it had really dark um, grain on it and then you see that kind of yellowish knot kind of start to surface even if you put kills or something like that on it when you're painting actual wood two to three coats and then you paint over it with a paint if it's a light color that's what that support induced discoloration is it starts going right through that I noticed that the other day on on some new construction um, and I was like ah, I know what that is <laughs> you needed gas. Well, it helps the surface take the paint more evenly, too. You yes. You never know how a natural product is yes. completely. So, so you do want to put that on there first. Next question. Will the acrylic scratch off of an aluminum panel? It will if you do it purposefully. Yeah. It actually bonds very well because it's a plastic. So it actually bonds better than oil because it's it's just, I don't know what it is. It, it bonded crazy well. And then I wanted to take a Dremel to some parts that I didn't leave the aluminum shine going through it with the chrome on the car and took a little bit and scratched it back out so you could see it. It still, I had to be very careful because that just really wanted to stay on there. So, yes. What's the difference between GAC 100 and PVA glue? And GAC 200. Okay, go to the website for the GACs. Each one of them, it's 100 to 900. Each of them are for different things. Some are for fabric, some are for really stiff panels only, some are to make something more flexible. Some of them you can even take and put them on fabric, drape them over something and it will dry and take that form of it. It's GAC 100 is the only one we need to concern ourselves with today if we're talking about support induced discoloration. Okay, you can use it as a medium. It is a little bit stickier feeling to thin your medium, 
to make it flow smoother to kind of thin the color for doing glazes. So it works for that, but it's really best for my purposes to actually put on bare wood. GAC 200 is specifically for non-porous. Yes. So like panels, like if you really wanted to put it on some sort of metal that you thought was reactive, um, you would do that. Mm -hmm. Yes. What are the pros versus the cons of painting on a canvas that's splined versus backstable? Um, there is a canvas episode that we've already done, and we talk about the differences in that. Um, I, I don't know. Can you find which episode that is on the list? You guys have access to the list. That's something that you can learn from that because that's not, we need to start moving on with the, just that's the basic the acrylic. Answer. Yeah, that's <laughs> not, not to avoid it, but that's, but it's something that takes some explanation and that's already on that canvas episode, uh, that we have, have talked about. So, um, are we good with questions? Can we move on to the next group or can those be saved to the next group? Okay. Frida, you good? Okay. All right. Color shift. That's something that mysteriously you hear with acrylics when the, you're reading the description of a brand and, oh, it's just the most wonderful and it can do anything and it can talk and walk and do, you know, dance the jig and there's no, little to no color shift, what does that mean? Because it doesn't make sense, does it? It, it sounds like I mean, it's like, I'm over here. No, I'm over here. <laughs> like they're shifty. Color shift is a way of saying the color that it is wet will look pretty darn close to the color that it is dry. Where you get issues with that is lower quality student acrylics. Because what they do is, okay, so we got titanium white. Titanium white's made up with one pigment. That's wonderful. You've got, uh, say this isn't, but say this is a, you know, cadmium yellow hue. This could be made up of anywhere from two to four or five pigments, depending on the brand. The more pigments that are in it, the more gummy it's going to be color wise, the more issues that you're going to have with as that dries, it's not going to so much look like it is wet. Then if this is a really low grade, you know, just beginner uh, starter kit that you find at a craft store, this isn't what that is, but just saying if, if this would be what it is, they're going to put very little pigment in and then they're going to put in things like inert fillers. Inert fillers aren't necessarily bad because you do have to have those to make heavy bodied paint. It's a colorless, not so much pigment, they call it a pigment, but it's like a colorless silica or something like that that uh, is in there to help with the body of it but that the color can then show through. Well, there's good fillers and there's junk fillers, just like think of a steak versus a McDonald's hamburger. They're both meat. meat. One is obviously not the same quality as the other one, okay? So the lower the quality gets, the more just kind of junk that's in there. So that's going to affect when it dries and the color has to dry around that junk, it's not going to be that same brilliant color that just squirted out of the tube. Um, so we've got, on one of the acrylics episodes that, well, actually it was a, an episode about pigment that we did for all types of pigment, but this is one of the acrylic boards that we did last year. Um, and the link will be in our, um, this was JL20 that this show came from. And we talked about student versus up to professional grade artist products. These are all these colors. And so what we're gonna do is the higher end ones are at the front. The kind of starter ones are here at the back. Yeah, that's probably a wise idea, Katie. It's just be easier to see. Which yes. Is um, I'm going to take them and start squishing some color next to the actual color that's on the squishing. That's a very technical term. Were you laughing at my technical term, Amanda? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, um, could that look any different than? Hold on. It's hard to see because the bottles and stuff okay. just turn it sideways. Okay. They're stuck to it, so I'm making kind of a racket with. Hey, what if you 
turn that whole thing sideways? Like on its side and split no, it like, out? That's right, because no, like you can't see oh. if the bottles are in the way. Ah, uh, we can, sure. Like landscape versus Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, technical, technical. <laughs> Jargon girl, okay. Woo, Whoa, that's, I, I, that's, that's the liquid. The liquid. <laughs> Woohoo! All right. You can see with this, that's a lot closer than this. Look at how dark mm -hmm. that is. Now, we also learned in this episode that just because you call something magenta or quinacridone doesn't mean it's the same pigment. Yeah. So you can see a lot of these are... We put sticky dots on them so they wouldn't move. Like this, this They're is not what a quinacridone magenta should be. That's like a rose pink. Now, their color shift is pretty, you know, that's not that bad, but it's still not the right color. Can everybody see? Is that picking up okay on the monitor where you can really see, can see how what's going on? There are. Okay. <laughs> this may not come up. Now, this is an acrylic gouache. This is why this is cracked, because you don't do acrylic gouache that thick, because there's much less resin in it. This is why you do color charts ahead of time and you let them careful. dry, yeah. So that you know what the color is. That's pretty darn close. If anybody does not want to do a swatch chart, I will do it for you. Yeah. Yes, Amanda is the swatch the swatchino. It's so zen to me. Look at that. Real. It is. I Look at that. It. That's great. That's gross. Yeah. <laughs> I got it on me, but that's okay. It's a badge of honor. That's like I mean close to these are all close to dead close. on. It's just not yes, a quinacridone. It's just no, it's like the least quinacridone of Uh oh. Did that mean you tried out? I well, we works. may have done this with it because the, we couldn't figure out how the, Oh careful, it's so liquidy. We couldn't figure out how the lid worked. Uh you know what? That looks like it needs to be separated, so hold on. But can you see the difference in them mm -hmm. with some of them and then that some of them are dead on? Are any of those Soho? Sometimes. Um, the second one over there is actually Soho, and I remember that being pretty darn close to yeah. the color. I just couldn't find it over there in the bin. Mm -hmm. Somebody's taken a bunch of the Soho colors and used them for another project, and I couldn't find it. But I remember being really impressed yeah. that that was that like good and I don't remember what this one was because the tag got taken yeah, the tag? I don't know so anyway so you can see what I mean by this is a why you want to do a color chart and let it dry so you know I can expect this color to look darker once it's dry so if I don't want it to be that dark I'm gonna need to add a little bit of white you could even do your color chart with the color a little bit of white a little bit of gray with it so you kind of already have an idea of what's going to happen. Mix some colors together. Make sure you document them on your color chart. But you can, because it, it does, if, if you want to paint with paints that have a lot of color shift, that's fine as long as you pre-plan and you know what's going to happen. Okay? Or you can go up into the professional colors if that's frustrating for you and then your painting dries a lot lighter than you thought or darker than you thought yeah, with some of these. Because, I mean, there's no rhyme or reason. Some of these are way lighter and some of these are way darker when they're dry. So this is why you do some of the research because it saves you the frustration and the time and the problems later. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? I just put it back here. Can you? I won't step into it. <laughs> Can you? Katie. Okay. He doesn't trust me. All right. Okay, so there's th we talk about that in the World Wonder of Acrylics episode JL15 and in JL20. So there's there's that stuff to go back through. You have homework. Okay. Oh, there's a heap and help and a homework here, Amanda. Oh, I laughed because there. someone said, how does Soho compare to Golden? For the price that they are, they're actually pretty decent. Yeah, bang for your buck. What, yeah. the, color, the color shift and all that's pretty decent. Where you... Where, 
where because it is more of a, um, it's not even a student grade so much, but it's not a high end professional grade, that is the, the pigment load isn't as high. It's got great resin in it. It's very shiny. It's very true. It's very pretty. It'd be great for doing it for even a professional painter to do backgrounds in as long as you are looking for opaque colors, get the opaque ones. But it's with some of the ones that are more transparent that you're like, with a professional one, I need one coat of this. I need two to three coats of this yeah. with this color. So that's the only place that that falls down comparatively. Mm -hmm. I'm consistently But Golden's price good. is like four yeah. times the oh, price yeah. for a two. I'm so, consistently shocked at how good the Soho is. Yeah, I mean, so that's, that's kind of, you, you sometimes have to pick your rattles as long as you know the difference and you know which one you're using and, and what its strengths and weaknesses are, go with the flow. All right, not saying Golden Flow Acrylics. <laughs> yeah. Or Matisse, all right. All right, varnishing. not knowing the difference between acrylic varnishes or what an isolation coat is. I really wanted to make this number one because after we did that varnishing episode and so many people had no idea there were isolation coats that you had to do that if you were gonna put a permanent varnish on your painting and that you can actually really damage your painting really bad if you don't do an isolation coat and then put a permanent varnish on it, this is number eight. Um, all right, so there's two types of varnishes with acrylics, right? Let me find the, the number. All right, we've got 13, eights up here. All right, two types of varnishes. You have permanent. Is that in the picture? And you have varnishes that can be removed. And in the middle is your isolation coat, or and your paint. paint isolation coat varnish, or the permanent varnish. Is the permanent varnish fine to use? Yes, but this is what it is, all right? So you've got, anytime it says medium and varnish, that means I can use this to add to my paint, to thin it out, because this is watery, right? We can hear it to thin my paint, to make less brush stroke, da, 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 to go along. And then when I'm done with the painting, I can be like, yay, I've given it 72 hours. I'm gonna put three coats of this on and be done. And my painting is done, yay. And now I just realized there's dog hair all in my varnish and it needs to be taken out. Do I just take my varnish off and then I can pick the hair out or I can paint over it, you know, take the varnish off. Guess what? This can't come off. There's dog hair in there. The beauty of this is, if you'd used these and then there was dog hair, you'd have to very meticulously take this off. And then you could try to fix it with the painting, let it dry, let it cure, revarnish. With this, as long as that surface is clean of, of other hair <laughs> or accoutrements, you can fix it with paint and paint right back over this because this is just basically a watered down version of paint, right? With resin. So the beauty of it is that's fine, you can use it. This is where it's a bad thing, okay? Say I've painted two paintings. With one, I put an isolation coat on and I put this varnish on it and, uh, and somebody bought it and it's hanging up in their house. Then they liked another painting that I did but the other painting was like 10 years before I knew that, you know, it'd be better to have a removable varnish. So the painting was painted and then this varnish was put on it and they put it on the other side of their hall in the same said house. So they have two of my acrylic paintings. I like these people because they've bought two paintings. They have a fire. Luckily the pets and everything make it out. Don't know why there's a backstory to it, but you know. The house is saved because it was the other end of the house that was on fire, but there's smoke damage everywhere, right? Okay, so now they come to me and they're just like, you know, one picture is, you know, of their dog Buster and the other one's Fifi the cat and they want them to be cleaned and taken care of. So they'll be, you know, beautiful and like new again. Buster was painted with this. Buster's okay because now I can go back 
And with mineral spirits with these two, or with a little bit of ammonia, take that varnish off there down to my isolation coat that I made with the soft gel. Clean the painting up real nice, re-varnish it. Looks brand spanking new, fantastic. How do I take this off? You don't. Buffy is forever smoky. Fifi. Okay, Fifi, it's a cat. The cat, <laughs> oh, sorry. Just identify myself as a dog person. I don't think that's a big surprise to anybody. This is why it's really a good idea to do the isolation coat and to go ahead and varnish it with varnishes that can be removed. A, there's no UVLS, no, no light help to keep it from UV rays damaging your painting over time. All of these have that built into the actual varnish, right? Um, this is fantastic because this is like, as long as you don't overspray, you can do lots of little nice coats. Katie and I love this because you, you just can't screw it up. You just can't. And it's a fantastic varnish. This takes a little bit more getting used to doing, but it's a good varnish too. This is the varnish that I used before this came into my life and swept me off my feet. Then the Gamvar, if you are an oil and an acrylic painter, these you can use over both. Problem solved. I don't know how many people have called me before and gone, I realized I used this on my yeah. oil painting. Oh no, it's happened. This goes for either one happily, hand in hand, works for both. It's fantastic. And the Gamvar, if you go to their website and look at their varnish application, see you can't screw this up either. It's dummy proof. So that's what you want to do with your beloved paintings. If it's just something that you know you, you're one of those people that puts it on the wall and you keep painting over it and over it and over it or adding this or adding that or trying this or that or you're a student, this is fine. But if you really want to finally sell it, you might want to varnish it with, through your isolation coat, which you can do over that. Varnish it with these. Can you take a second to just talk about just the isolation coat? Like That is in like our varnishing it. episode. Just give them a, it's a buffer. It is a buffer. What this is, is is the, you actually add water to it. Um, you thin it down to a certain percentage. And we talk about that in the varnish episode. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. Um, you do several coats of this. I think it's at least two. What this does is it protects an overzealous cleaner. It's the cream in your Oreo. It is. Mm -hmm. From cleaning down with one of these, because ammonia, although, I mean, ammonia packs a little bit of a punch, and mineral spirits isn't as bad, but if you're really overzealously scrubbing something, when that comes off very easily, it could bite into uh, the, the surface of your acrylic paint. Acrylic paint is a plastic, essentially. It's a plastic resin. It's very soft. It's very porous. Even with this, it's very porous, okay? With this, it becomes a much harder, like think of the Dairy Queen ice cream that they dip in that chocolate sauce and all of a sudden it gets hard and protects the ice cream. Crack, crack, crack. It's, I mean, that's what it is. Yeah. So this is that that's layer that protects buffer. between the two. Yeah and gives it so that when you're cleaning down into it, it's not gonna bite into the actual painting and damage the painting itself. Okay, does that make sense? And that's Especially in the, I've got, clear. I've got links um, to this. It was the JL43 varnishing episode that we did on Facebook, but then we also did an after party where you see Mike and I actually do the isolation coat so that you understand how to do it on your actual painting, and that um, is on our YouTube channel, Jerry's RM YouTube channel, okay? So, march away a little bit, people. All right. Now, using the wrong types of brushes with acrylics or not having enough brush variety. All right, now, something nobody wants to hear is, I'm an oil painter, can I just use my oil painting brushes on my acrylics? No, 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 God no, no, love no. ya, I just wish it was possible. I wish that that was fine and that I could tell you, they'll work with both, it's no. 
it's it's like it's like saying football and squash are the same sport because people tackle each other. Not not even no or I or. Think you mean rugby. Okay, that one. I don't know what squash is. <laughs> That's, that's, it just sounds like they squash with, people. That's, that's play with rackets. It's like racquetball. Well, so it's not the same. It's a sport. <laughs> but you don't Sport, have sport. Yeah. yeah. Okay, no. Leave it to the European to correct me. That's fine. Okay, rugby, football, right? Seems like they're the same. Totally different rules. Yeah. Totally different playing field. Totally different uniforms. Unfortunately, these are the same thing. Now. People always want to use, okay, well, that's fine. I'll just buy other brushes like what I've got for oils. I really would recommend you don't use natural hair brushes with this. Oil painting is something where you can be painting along, the phone rings, you set it down, you know, back in the day before cell phones, because I think all of you are old enough to know what that was like. You, your friend talks to you because they tend to do that, and then you're like 20 minutes later, oh crap, I left my brush there. What's well, oils? It doesn't matter. That happened with acrylics. It's now this with acrylics. And then you do that with it. I dropped it. Okay. It's crunchy because the resin in that just dried and you can try to soak it and you can try to put soap in it and you can try to do a lot of things, but the likelihood that you're going to get that off after it's sat there all that time with the acrylic paint on it is probably not going to happen. It's probably toast. Okay. Well, it's now coated in plastic. Yes. So think of it this way. Everybody knows, you know, that hairs have pores. We use hair conditioner, right? Because it makes our hair softer. It makes our hair silkier and smoother. It seals in that hair follicle, right? So natural hair brushes have that. These do not. The differences between acrylic brushes and oil brushes are that the way this holds more paint is it's got different sized hairs, okay? All of these filaments are different sized to mimic what natural hair is like. Natural hair on our heads, some are thin and some are thick and you know, all that. They basically, with the technology today, have made it so that that acts more like, they know that, they've been able to manage that in a brush to space it out. That acts more like where it will soak up a little bit more wet media. It will still be stiffer if they use a stiffer filament to handle heavier paint. But yet, when that resin is sitting in there, it's not gonna soak into those little holes and pores in the hair and then be impossible to get out because it just cements in. This is much slicker, it's smoother, it's going to more easily rinse. If it starts drying a little bit, it's gonna be more forgiving and, and come out much easier. Does that mean you shouldn't wash your brushes? Oh no, we'll talk about that because that's even closer up to the end of the countdown because brush hygiene is just a horrible thing that nobody likes to do, but that's really necessary and the most necessary in acrylics out of all the mediums. Um, now, how do I know if I'm a painter, and, I, and especially if you've come from an oil painting background, you're used to generally starting your painting off with hog bristle brushes, right? Something like this, where they say it's a synthetic hog, um, which we've got a new one that's coming out. What's the name of that? I can't remember it, but I don't have, I, I don't have I any from the set that I had in my office when um, I tested them. I it's one of the New York Central, New York Central brushes. Ones, yeah. um, we've got a new one that's coming out that says that's a synthetic or a partially synthetic hog. This is the Mimic hog. This is full synthetic, but yet, it's got more of that stiff sound of a hog bristle. Um, it can really power through heavier, uh, you know, if you're painting with super heavy body, if you're painting with gels, if you're painting with paste. Um, it's stiffer on the end. It's got that harder edge like you're used to with a hog bristle with kind of a, not the exact same natural flagging as you're gonna get, but like with the filberts and stuff, the way they've shaped them, it performs very much like They're a natural Pretty close. Flag. They are pretty close. I mean, in performance wise. They where are where it's an issue because with oils, you're kind of brushing in your, your brush cleaner so that you don't scrape yeah. it off those little holes in the bottom. A lot of people just don't, don't think about it, cram it down in their bucket and go, just like a hog bristle brush. What was that? Be, 
just because it's synthetic, you still want to clean it like a natural hairbrush, okay? So these are great. Heavy loads, your first coats, if you uh, paint more like impasto, more painterly, more impressionistic, these can be your entire painting, you know, needs are filled right there. I don't think people realize how much the technology for oh, no, it's crazy. advanced in just the past couple of years. I it's said, it's like, crazy. like my father who, who was managed plants and was in like Fortune 500 companies, managing companies, he said he would retire before he had to have a computer and then he had to have one right at the end and then he was like, oh, okay, it wasn't that bad. I said, I will never use synthetic brushes. I refuse to. It's what do I probably yeah. words. <laughs> use more now, even with watercolor, which that was the last holdout. I said I would never I was do saying, that. How about those uh, mimics? There? I know. I know. Numbered. But it's because technology has come so it far. It is. It's come so I'm far. I'm happy to embrace technology yeah. if it gives me the same performance and a lower price point. You know, I mean, I, I don't want little animals to be brushes either, but sometimes if it's a brush that I, you know, I've got brushes that are four years old that were my grandma's, so they're older. They're natural hair brushes, but they were good natural hair brushes. Some of these, if you take care of them, I've had th these Pro Stroke, when they came out, I've had some since then. I've had some for years, As yeah. acrylic brushes, but you know how you usually cycle through them and get rid yeah. of them. No, I've had those for a long time. So these, we, we do two Pro Stroke brushes, and I had somebody that contacted me, it was hilarious. We have two Pro Stroke brushes. One is a white bristle, hog bristle, that's for oils. The Pro Stroke, Power Krill, sounds like acrylic, so that's yeah. what it's for. But to make it even, because the black, they both have black handles and look kind of similar, red dip dents on the acrylic. So you know these are your acrylic brushes. The other ones don't have that. They're gold, right? And I think they're silver. On those. They're shiny. Yes. So that's how you know what those are. So those are gonna, just a minute, Amanda, and I'll catch you. Those are gonna be kind of, somewhat like the hog where they've got a little bit they can have the ability to hold a little heavier load they've got a little bit smoother release of the paint I love this brush. it's softer but it's not quite like sable either fully so it's a very nice in between if you mm -hmm. like mongoose brushes and you're an oil painter this has kind of a similar workhorsey feel but can lay down some um, glazing and things like that yeah, so, like so able to get the brush strokes out and those I can do that. Yes. Way. So that's another and, and and I'm not so much talking about these are the only brands there are. There's there's plenty of them, but these are the four kind of real styles of brushes that you're going to find with acrylic. Um Amanda, is it a brush question? Yeah. Okay. What do you think which um acrylic synthetic brush can take the biggest beating and still hog? Okay. Um, brushes can't always compensate for a heavy-handed painter. It's going to be whatever one. Should we show them all your brushes? <laughs> your painting style, unfortunately, um, and what similar, like a similar hog style bristle in one brand may not hold up to your roughness as another brand does. So, unfortunately, the best thing I can recommend for you to do, because it really does depend more on you being heavy or lighter-handed. If there's a size, like I use size four for some reason, uh, I always have so many size fours and burn through them so fast in both oil and acrylic. Anytime I'm gonna try a new style of brush, whether we make it or not, I buy size fours because I know what those feel like. I know this about the size they are. I always buy the shapes that are my favorite. And then that will immediately tell me within painting for 10 or 15 minutes, ooh, I love this, or this is gonna go to somebody else. Riker. Where are you? Does it make how you like, like paint easier, yeah. or huh? Does it help or hinder how you're painting? Right, exactly. Maybe it's a little bit different, but it, maybe it's fine. And do it in the style that you're doing it in. If you tend to be rough, be just as rough as you normally be. If you tend to be very delicate, the same thing. Look at how easy it is to clean. Is it easier to clean than the other one? And they hold up about the same. Maybe that's better for you because that's usually better brush life. Okay, is that mm -hmm. okay? Um, so the next thing are black swan. Black swan are designed to be more, <coughs> excuse me, your softer bristle, they're going to be more like a sable, like a red sable. Okay. They, they've got a very soft release of the paint. They've got a little bit more body like a sable. So they hold, um, 
more fluid if you're gonna be doing glazing and things like that this wouldn't be what you'd want to be using while you're doing in your you know background on something where you're painting with heavy gels and things like that this isn't going to work for that this is where you're starting to fine-tune your painting or you're just one of those people that paints much more realistically you maybe you're into trompe l'oeil maybe you're into just things being really tight really realistic this is going to give you more that sable like control and feel so that's the black swan and those are 100 percent synthetic then for something that's going to give you a little bit tighter edge more like maybe a higher end sable like a kalinsky which it doesn't make as big of a deal in oils and acrylics as it does in watercolor you're not going to get the same point even on oil and acrylic brushes that are full kalinsky um, but this is going to get have more that design of how the brush comes together would be something like the ebony splendor okay so and if you're not sure always look at them usually when they try to make it look like tip sable like a kalinsky that's a pretty good example yeah. of that's probably what that brush style is supposed to be doing okay so the, the handles are a little leaner like a, like more of a delicate control style brush um, that whole kind of line is a little more kind of petite and elegant so it kind of gives you that indication absolute opposite of what this looks like this says hey baby want me to slap some paint around and you're like yeah this is like so can i finesse you know that's creeping me out a little bit katie <laughs> <laughs> katie's like uh -uh. <laughs> so those are pretty much the four styles of acrylic brushes now you can also get like the crazy big heavy ones like the the liquitex freestyle brushes that are like three inches wide with a big handle with we did three different brush episodes if you're interested in oil or acrylic brushes jl6 was our first brush breakdown show we did that really early on and we went over a whole bunch of stuff like especially into oil brushes just like all the crazy tweaks and you know all that um then we did brush breakdown two which is all the short handle brushes that also includes like if you're working in acrylic gouaches where you're sitting and not easel painting these are much more for if you're standing or sitting but you're painting in an easel so you need that longer length of brush um the second one was jl13 that is more the brushes where you're sitting painting flat decorative brushes uh, are big in that one so if you're using acrylics for that that might help you um then we had brush breakdown three which was jl19 that was the freak show i think we did the uh the great big crazy freestyle brushes down to some like little weird types of brushes in that episode now that i think about that that's the second time riker's been on because he was in brush breakdown three the freak show yeah. or one of them maybe he was in the no he was in the short handled one sorry okay so brushes uh, we will take one more and then we'll have questions not learning what acrylic mediums are about or for what applications like we just talked about the pace we talked about the gels there's all these things and this is really not what you want to start doing per se I would say learn the medium and then start incorporating all this these aren't even just like a third of the things that are out there. <laughs> Not even. These are a smattering. These are the ones that are. You can most do. Most lines tend to have. These like I said, you can do so much with it. Read the copy. Read the copy. Could I say it again? Read the copy. Don't just assume one gel medium means oh, because uh, there's a high solid gel. There's an extra heavy gel. There's a heavy gel, there's a soft gel, there's a regular gel, semi-gloss. There is a gel medium. There's pumice gel, there's sand oh. gel, there's glass beads, there's granular gel, there's pumice. I wish they could see, cause like. It's, uh, it, there's so much freaking stuff. And then this one's... I mean, there's just, and I've got this upside down, which is just <laughs> really confusing and I'm sorry. I mean, there's, there's just so much. There's so much stuff. And again, nobody wants to have to go back to school and learn this stuff. 
God knows every week sometimes I'm just like, uh, my brain is full and I can't take anymore. It's not full. <laughs> other, thing, other things that are less important fall out to make room, I think. But, but you do yourself a favor. There's really cool yeah. fun stuff out there, but don't just order something without researching it first. And again, the manufacturer websites are a ridiculous wealth of knowledge that you can... Make your tools work for you, not yes. against you. And several here, of them here. have samplers of yes. sets of yes. different mediums. Exactly. So yes. And if you if it's hard to find on the website, you can always call in and ask or email customer service and ask. We will, we're happy to help you find different trial stuff and all that if it's something, you know, where it's hard to find on the website. Because there's there's so many mediums, there's a lot of pages of them. It can be confusing. All right, questions, and then we're going to the top five. So many. <laughs> Number one, what is the best medium to create glaze? That's from the very beginning of the episode. Glazing medium. <laughs> it, it sounds it sounds dummy proof. Some of them are having a hard time hearing um, the girls. Can you repeat okay. the question? Someone please? asked, what is the best medium for glazing? There's glazing medium or just where they say a gloss medium or maybe it's a matte medium. That's your liquid. You want something that's liquidy without just thinning it with water. In your preferred sheen. Yes, in whatever your preferred sheen is, which again, the varnish is your final sheen. You don't have to have matte to start with. In fact, it's better not to because you need the clarity of that color to come through. Then you can matte it at the end. If you put too much matting agent in between, your colors start getting foggy. And if you're painting a lot of layers, it can get foggier and foggier. And if that's not your intention, it, it can make what could have been a very crisp, beautiful painting, but just matte finished, look like it's in a forest fire smoke scene or something like that. Easy. Yeah. Okay, more questions. Um, we just got one that asks, if you want a soft, realistic look of colors on a canvas using acrylic, what's the best type of undercoat to use? What's the best type of undercoat for a soft look? It, it's about having softer brushes and it's about technique. N there, there's no undercoat that's going to help you. It's, it's about researching and learning those techniques or finding somebody that paints that way and asking them a lot of questions. Um, it's about maybe taking a class from somebody that has that style that's local that you're like, hey, I want to know how to paint like that. It, it's not like a magic thing like, oh, hey, if you get this color mm -hmm. and you put that down first, it's not, I, I know, I know with Bob Ross and things like that. That was her inspiration. It can be very, it can make it seem like it's some magic product that does that. You can do that without having to paint like that. Um, and it opens up a whole, or with those products, and it opens up a whole new realm of, it's just in the instruction and you're learning it. Technique, not a trick. Yes. I wish it was a trick, it'd be so much easier. Ta-da! Mixing different brands of paints using a cheaper undercoat versus a more expensive top coat. Yay, nay, suggestions? Anytime you wanna do that, where you're mixing the, the product, <laughs> Uh, Frida asked if, if you want to use less expensive either either kind of you know lower grade or mid grade like especially if you're working big somewhere in the painting to kind of help save money but you do have some nicer paints it's just you're kind of trying to to save them for always paint lesser quality under better quality because you want your top layers are what everybody sees right so that's gonna help with coverage with the cheaper stuff, theoretically. It, it, with, with oil paint or with acrylic paint, I will say this is where I think that holds the most true, don't you, Katie? Because with oils, you can extend really heavily, super pigmented, like Old Holland, a tube of Old Holland that's little will go way further than a giant tube of, you know, the Windsor Newton Winton because the pigmentation is so much stronger. Acrylics are where you can only do so much with the resins. This isn't as, as true of a statement. So always put your better quality over the top. Use the lesser quality for your bigger, flatter areas of color where you're just getting stuff down. 
Okay. Going back to isolation codes. Okay. Um, this is a two or three part question. <laughs> the golden isolation coat there, what, what is that? It's you always want to use a soft gel medium. Soft Where did gel it go? Medium? There's something in the way, and it needs to be either a gloss or a semi-gloss. There's something in the way that resin is made where, A, it's spreadable, but it's still got enough resin where when you thin it with water, it's not going to become too weak. It'll, it'll become more, more brushable where it covers it, but it's going to actually cover the painting more safely. That's what Golden recommends. So, and if that's what they say, that's what I'm going to default to as the truth. Is there a spray version or can you use that in an airbrush? If, if the problem is when you're, when you're using an airbrush, you're going to have to put an airbrush medium with it, right? Um, this is going to be clear if you do it correctly. So you'll probably have to brush it on to make sure it gets like, especially if you've got, I'm guessing that whoever's asked this question has larger works that have like a lot of peaks and nooks and crannies and things like that. You're really going to need to just thin it out and brush it on. Um, it, it's. I feel like an airbrush would give you too. Airbrush medium thin is going to be different. It's going to yeah. it's going to have different resins well, and, and it stuff. Well, it's going to be too thin of a layer too, because that's yes. kind of the whole point of an airbrush is a really light thin right. layer. So it's not going to give you enough. You would have to, to, to do difference. so many layers. Yeah. It would just you would waste so much time yeah. doing that. I'm where where you would think it would help with time. I think it would increase your time. Yeah, I agree. So yes. I mean, they could call. They, I'm going to default and say Liquitex has a great uh, technical department. So does Golden. You can always call yeah. them and ask. Maybe there's a way to do it that they can recommend. If you want to varnish a mixed media or iridescent painting, like where they've used iridescent yes. paints, um, would you still use the isolation coat and the same varnishes you've mentioned there? It, okay, if if the I if okay, she's asking, would you use an isolation coat over things like mixed media or something with iridescence or pearlescence or I'm guessing things right. like that? A, it's got to all be acrylic or watercolor or water based. You can't put this over oil paints. Mixed media just means a bunch of different kinds of media. It doesn't specify, oh, these are all, mixed media means all water-based mixed media. You can, I do oils over charcoal, over acrylic, over all sorts of different stuff. With oil as the last layer, guess what the varnish is? It's oil. gonna it's gonna be an oil-based varnish or a mineral spirit-based varnish. I'm not going back in over the acrylic doing an isolation coat because there's not a safe way to do it. Okay? So it, it needs to be, First, it needs to be, is it is it all water-based? Then yes, you need to do this. And this is, you want the gloss because that's gonna give you the clearest sheen so that the color picks up in those iridescence and things like that. And if you're using metallics, you're using iridescence, you're using anything that needs to have that light travel through the resin to give you that sparkling shine, you've got to glow with a gloss varnish because a satin is going to dull that and not let the light come through to give you that depth. Okay? Other questions? Would you use a glue or a wax as an isolation coat or you need to do? You have to, you, if it's acrylic, you've got to use that soft gel because we talked that it's a very, very soft, medium okay and it's very porous this is going to get seal it as best as possible before you're putting a varnish on that you want to be removable okay it's like put an umbrella over your head out in the rain it's protecting you right from the elements this is protecting that so that anything that falls on you know your varnish is on top of that but if you want to remove it later everything underneath is still the same and dry all right. Any other questions? Or are we good to go into the next? Oh, we have more questions. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> I feel like I need a can I have of worms a couple to open. Questions about brushes. Um, okay. Do you have a recommendation for detail brushes for acrylics? And what brushes would you recommend for gouache? Wash? Is it is it watercolor? Well, okay. They didn't so, specify what type of gouache. Okay. It depends on if you're with gouache. It depends. 
She asked brush recommendations for detail and for gouache. I'm guessing most people that do gouache are doing it flat on a tabletop. They don't need a long handled brush like acrylic easel painting is going to be. So what you're gonna wanna do is look at synthetic watercolor brushes for that. Watercolor brushes are always short handled because you need that detail. Any of the decorative style brushes even will give you great detail. Detail depends on what you want. Do you want uh, you know, a flat that looks at those narrow, you know, hard edges? Do you want something that's more like a round that's gonna hold medium but release it only at the tip? Watch that one show that's about the short brushes, that's the brush breakdown too. That will be all the types of brushes that you're gonna wanna look at. Um, and I do believe we talked about using some of those. And I know in the watercolor brushes episode, we did use a lot of those too, didn't we, Katie? Mm -hmm. That was this year that we did. So that would be a good episode to watch to see the tips and what detail you can get out of. And we yeah. went through a, just a That's a whole two hour long episode brand. in itself. Yes. <laughs> if you're doing gold leafing on a painting, um, somebody asked if you would use an isolation coat over that. I don't know. That would be something that you probably, she asked if you're doing gold leafing on a painting. It depends, okay, okay, A, it depends on if it's a real, a real right. gold leaf, okay? Because some of those have gold, have oil sizing, some of them have a water-based sizing. Usually you have to put that over the top to seal it, so that's gonna protect it from that, and then you can go from there. If that, if it's oil-based, you've gotta go with an oil varnish over it. You can't then put an acrylic isolation coat over it and then the oil, you know, varnish over the top or, a, you know, a mineral spirit based varnish. But what you can do is if the rest of it around it is acrylic, you could put that isolation coat on that part, then do that varnish across the top of it. I would say, uh, talk to, there's gilding, um, like regional gilding groups. I would talk to somebody that does gilding, God forbid, before you do anything, because gilding that can is a mess whole up. Different, oh yeah. yeah, that's, that can mess can mess stuff up, stuff up easily. When I did the the thing recently with the um, the Pebio gilding, I just did um, just a quick retouch over it. It depends on if you're using actual gold leaf or you're using a right. gold a metal or or, a metal. or it's a metal yeah. leafing that's not a yeah yeah. Yep, that you you talk to a professional. I'm not. I don't know, so I'm 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 saying that that needs to come from somebody who really does it and knows their stuff. And it ranges so much between each individual oh, one. Oh yes, it's crazy. Yeah. Yes. My last question. Okay. On this crazy page full of stuff. Oh, um, she is a novelette. <laughs> color shift is that immediate from the time it dries from when it's wet to dry, or can that happen over a longer period? Color of time? shift is going to be wet to dry. Once that surface is dry to the touch, that's gonna to be your color. It's not gonna change from there. It's not like an oil painting that dries from the back all the way out. And again, like I said, that's something totally different with oil painting. You don't have that issue because it's a completely different binder. The acrylic, as soon as that's dry to the touch, that's the color that you're gonna have. Unless you do something crazy with varnishing, you know, but uh, where it, it Unless lightens you do it. Something to like, well, it. like if you do a matte varnish yeah. and you don't stir it well enough and then it makes it lighter because of the kind of yeah, whiteness of it. All right, well, let's jump into the top five and then we'll do uh, questions after that. I feel like we got a lot of people that have a lot of questions, so we, I don't want to skimp on anybody, but we also need to get, yeah, get the last five out. Not using palettes designed for acrylics. We're in the top five, which are the things that you'd think would be obvious, but that necessarily aren't. Can you get, grab me a wood palette over there? Just grab one of the ones over there, just so we can show that. I have seen more even companies. There's some stain from it, actually. And, 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 and I know that we have been guilty of that in the past when we had people in photography that didn't have an art background where they show acrylics being used with the wood palette. No, Don't just it. no. <laughs> You'll A, never get it off. <coughs> It'll always ooze down in the little, the little <coughs> bit of, even if it's sealed, ooze down in any little crooks and crannies and nooks and 
things and you can't mist this to keep your paint wet. This will turn this into a big mushy jumble of goo. It actually sucks the moisture out, which is the opposite of yes. what you want to do. You <laughs> don't want this. You don't want this, not for acrylics, not now, not ever. Never. It's like Dr. Seuss, not on a boat, not with a goat. Were you painting In it? a box with a fox? Not there either. How and it's not where I'm, you're gonna change your mind at the end of it, like in Green Eggs and Ham. I think he was just tired, he gave up. <laughs> All right, so what you need is a plastic palette, okay? And that can be any number of things. If you want them where, you know, you like holding a palette, that's fine, but I will say that because you need to keep misting that palette every, you know, five minutes or so, especially if it's dry in your house or your studio, it's gonna, unless you're holding it very, like this there's oil on this I know no I know but I would never use this for acrylic because I don't stand like you, that when I paint with acrylic you you can't holding it like this is gonna hurt the your the back of your elbow mm -hmm. you would need to keep misting that is gonna do this because everybody turns their hand as they're working so this works fine if it's sitting on your you know table or whatever, but then if you keep misting a lot, it could roll off. The best thing, I think, put this over here, back, is something with a little bit of an edge, like a butcher's tray. Um, this is just a plastic butcher's tray. It peels the acrylic off. There's been acrylic in this a number of times. I only see a little bit of tiny white stain, and I think that was from when somebody put oils in it because I can see that the it's got had a little bit of solvent in it from what plastic looks like after solvent use. So this is perfect. You can mist. You can even put plastic wrap over this because it's got that edge and it's going to keep it from sticking to your paint. That'll help preserve paint overnight. Sometimes you can go two or three days with plastic wrap, but air can get through that. So this would be perfect. Um, then you've got covered palettes where you can keep the paint a lot longer. Um, this is the Mahello Airtight palette. Still that plastic where it peels off. Your paints can go down and in there. You've got a mixing area in the middle. You've got a mixing area on the lid. Just be careful you don't make this too thick and then go put it back on. You can keep misting that and work. When you're done, there's this little airtight kind of spline that's rubber. You can put that down. Put a sponge in it. If you, if you missed it enough, you don't even have to do that. If you're gonna leave it from, for a long time, then yeah, it would probably be good to mist it good and then put like a little piece of sponge. The problem is sponges can go bad. Um, this thing, this is the Mac Daddy of acrylic palettes and I'm just gonna say that because I have one. I had it long before I worked at Jerry's. When this came out, I was like, they had it on sale and I was like, well, I have made paint last more than four months in this mm -hmm. before which is insane for acrylics, think yeah. about the amount of money that i saved with doing because what i do is take this off there's a big palette upside down you can do this goes out and sits by sits on my table by the easel this has paint in it that i put in that i put back in here and forget there should be another one in here but it's around here somewhere then there are two trays in each of these things that can come out you can scoop some on, bring this out, mist, put this back on, be working over here, just keep misting those, go back in for some more paint, keep doing that. When you're all done, you can either wipe this off, put it back in, you can keep the paint on here if you've been good about misting it, put all this back in, that if you're gonna turn it upside down needs to be misted. Put this back in here, as long as every time you open this you miss that paint, four months or more which is ridiculous such a cost saver uh, you can tell I really like this product <laughs> just Amanda's like, just like can't you even keep a house plant alive <laughs> for four months or more <laughs> misting <laughs> every day yes <laughs> this it, it, I, I've never used this one they just didn't ha have this at the time I got this this would probably be nice too I would just be concerned that all these colors are sitting open over and over as long as I was really maniacal about misting now I will say that um, 
that once I went on a weekend painting binge and I forgot this palette at work with paint in it. So I used one of these on my Soul Tech easel and it fit right in the middle like that. And all I did was mist it and then I put plastic wrap over it and that lasted the whole weekend. Preston Seal is fantastic. Yes. And it wasn't, I, I don't buy that expensive one. It was just, it was just the regular house brand of that. But it worked for a weekend. So you can keep this for a little while as long as you're good about misting in between. So those all peel right off because it's plastic. Once you're done with it, you set it out, you let it dry a couple days. If, it, if it's hard to get it off, you put a little bit of water in it, let it set, you can go and it'll pop right off. Don't run it down your drain. Because it will harden, what? Did uh, you I was say that? I say it's so satisfying to peel the paint off. Yes, it is, it's pretty fun. Not satisfying yes, trying to peel it off of the inside yeah. of your pipes. No, because it <laughs> sticks. Or, or or your sink, when it gets yeah. stuck, the wet part gets stuck in your sink and you've got stainless steel and trying to get that off, not not good. That's for another time. Um, number four. Ugh. Katie, can you zoom in? This is a big water this, bucket there. This is number four, you leaving your paintbrushes in the water soaking. Look what this does, look, you can peel this right off. It's all split up the sides. Just cause it's hard doesn't mean putting it in the water is going to, it's just gonna have ruined this. I put this in here earlier, you can already see it's starting to get cracks. This has been in the water about three hours. None of these are cracking, but these are actually good. We get that a lot in customer service. Yep. We, we do, but you know what? All these have been in the water for three hours. These three were not damaged prior, and they've actually held up pretty well. But I know people that will soak them underwater overnight. But look what it did to the tips. Yeah. That's damaged. That's going to be splayed. This is not ever going to keep the point that it had. And this is and this is splayed out. That's not going to come back to a, a nicer point. So leaving those stuck down in there is going to damage stuff over time, especially these. Handles, the, it swells that, when it's in yes. water. Well, and not to mention that now these have to be hung up and completely dried like this so all the water comes out because you go to start using that in your next painting, and even if you've blotted it out, you're painting along and then all of a sudden your acrylic is Blurp. thinning and flowing and turning into this mushy, gushy mess. So don't do this. Put your brush in, get all the color out, look, make sure all the color is out. If there's any little residual up here, get it out immediately. Do that, blot it on a dry rag or, you know, paper towels and set it aside like this to dry. You can go back and use it, but don't leave it stuck. If it's to the point of where it's stuck in your brush so bad that you're just sticking it in there and not addressing it right away, that's probably gonna be a throwaway brush. This thing is like ridiculously yeah, heavy. Why like, have I never had one of these before? To be honest, most of the complaints come from paint and sip owners. Yeah. That well, they're okay. like, you just throw them all in a bucket. That's and like, why. Well, yeah. Okay, well you can do that with a brush, and, and, and I'll address that real quick, because I did put one of these in here. You can do that with a brush like the Dura Handle brush, the thing is, not all brushes are Dura handles. This is an acrylic, it's a long handled brush. It's got a little bit of flex to it. If you're painting and you're painting with a heavy load, that's not really great for that. It's one thing at a paint and sip place where people are just kind of dabbing and, mm -hmm. and all that. And it's not as good a quality of a bristle head. Yes, this is resin, so that's not gonna split. This is treated so that it's not gonna tarnish, but for you as a fine artist, this is this brush is designed for schools. This brush yeah. is designed for paint and zip. This brush is designed for people who don't treat their brushes don't carefully. Care, yeah. Who don't care, you know, or don't know any better. Kids don't know any better, and kids are very busy, happy. They want to paint, and they don't want to mess with it. Then, yes, that's fine. Just stick that in there, but you don't want that brush for you. All right. So... Number four, not washing those brushes out after every painting session. I told you you can put it in the bucket. I told you, you know, take your brush, 
don't do it down and jab, pull, 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 so it keeps it to the tip, but then you're gonna actually want to clean that out. Now, I don't have the pink soap. I thought we had it here and we didn't. Um, with acrylic brushes, I will use something that's a little bit more caustic that you would never ever want to use in your oil painting brushes. I put the pink soap on the list. It's a type of soap that's kind of similar to more of a dish detergent. That will get down in there under that plastic. You when have you, that what? You have that I, I couldn't find it. I looked everywhere. You're gonna take that, you're gonna put a little bit of brush cleaner in your hand. You're gonna work it up into the ferrule, up into the bristles, and then you're gonna rinse it out. Now, sometimes, because that's not, it's a little bit more caustic than a natural brush thing, it's gonna do this with the brush bristles, right, Katie? Mm -hmm. So then what it's you're gonna well. do, and that's only if it's really gross and dirty and kind of has that ring along the edge of where you've kind of been putting it in the paint and not being good about rinsing it as you work. I would recommend, even if you're really in the process of a color and this is the brush you're really gonna stick with, but you notice that it is starting to dry, take a minute, go ahead and clean that out just for the brush hygiene part of it. Rinse it out good, and then can blot it, continue to reuse it. If it starts getting frayed, if it starts losing shape, a great natural brush uh, cleaner like the Chelsea Lavender Soap, like this, or the Jack's Linseed Soap, which is liquidy, are fantastic for cleaning that brush in. Again, you can let this sit overnight. It won't damage the brush. Shape those bristles with either one of these. Rinse it out before the next time that you paint. You know, blot it out. And it kind of helps pull that brush back to its natural memory that it kind of got out of from agitating it to get those bristles clean. This stuff saves some oil painting brushes and some acrylic brushes that I had that really needed to be thrown out. I put it in some acrylic brushes and let it sit for two or three days and was shocked and amazed. Now they were synthetic, but just that it actually did come out of them, it was pretty crazy. I'd even tried Dawn, which I usually won't touch dish soap if, if you know, even with dishes, because if it tears my hands up, what is it doing to, to brushes? So it saved some brushes that I really need to thought about that I would just need to toss. So these soaps are really good. Your brushes are an investment. If you get decent ones, treat them well, clean them. You know, you don't go five weeks without washing your hair. God, I hope at least not. Clean these after every time so that the performance is as similar. And, and acrylic brushes do have an age on them. Uh, oils, I think, sometimes you can get them to last a long time. Acrylic brushes more almost have a shelf life. They're used a lot. So you, but you can increase that greatly by proper brush hygiene. All right. Thinning with too much water is number two. I don't know how many people I've seen and a lot of beginners do it, and I've seen regular artists do it, where they're thinning with too much water and their layers of paint aren't bonding properly to each other. Because rather than put out that little bit of gloss medium or something in it to kind of dip that brush in to thin the paint, they just keep pouring on more water or misting water on it or whatever. That not only dulls the coat, makes it more matte because you're breaking that resin down but it also can make it so I've seen people walk up to their painting and go, oh, what is that? Painting is dry. They've put too thin of coats on top. They go like that to rub it, gone. That little bit of what they thought was glazing with the color didn't stick because the resins didn't bind because the resins really weren't there anymore. Not cool. Think about it this way, mud puddles. When you're a kid, and the mud puddle's just a little bit cloudy, like not quite chocolate milk, and it's really thin, and you can see it settling back down. That's what I want you to think of the next time you thin your acrylic paint out, is how is that really gonna stick to the next layer? If you're making a mud pie, do you just put a little crumble of mud and then dump some water in on top and think that's gonna work for a mud pie when you're a kid? You want it nice and thick and chunky, right? Even if it flows better, you don't, you don't like my mud pull? Is that, is that like, unrelated. okay, I thought it was like Sorry. a gib, like giblets. It was having the giblets no, effect. No, <laughs> For, I was like, well, I'm gonna start using mud puddle now. Nothing has <laughs> the giblets effect. Okay, 
So think about that. Think about mud puddles. Think about it being very thin and wispy and chocolate milky. That's not gonna help bind to your next layer, okay? Number one, I can't overemphasize this enough. Mist your freaking acrylic paint while you work. If you're in a dry area, you're gonna have to probably do it more than every five minutes. If you're in a really humid area and you don't have like a crosswind and it's a moist day, you might be able to get away with it seven to 10 minutes. So did I just say another word, Amanda? Moist is now a word too. It's everyone's trigger word. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, you've gotta say it with this. <laughs> Something to consider because you're spraying this in a palette potentially that you're closing up, distilled water. Mm. Don't use tap water or well water. Well water is even way worse because goodness only knows what little creepy crawlies are in there and how, you know, if you set a glass of water up on the counter and forget it for a few days, three or four days, and you come back and go to dump it out, it's kind of slimy and gross sometimes, right? Or no, cloudy. I mean, the additives they put in well water. Yes, yeah. or even in city water and yeah. stuff. That stuff is not good with the resins. Distilled water is purified. It's gonna be something, you know, just keep a jug, keep pouring it into this. It really even wouldn't be, if you're gonna thin some with water, and you better only be thinning some, use distilled water in a special cup that you've got that's what you dip your brush in before you go to just maybe thin that heavy body paint just to make it slightly more brushable, that's okay. But use distilled water. But when people are always like, oh my God, my kids are like, oh my God, with the misting they hear, you know, <laughs> constantly. And I'm like, uh, yeah, cause it doesn't dry the paint out. So, cause once you start getting that paint skin on top and it starts oxidizing, going in and either picking it up and trying to get more out of it, when that starts drying and starts getting thick and sticky, it can do things, it can pull up layers. It's just a bad idea. If you're gonna leave it for more than just running to the bathroom, two minutes, running to the bathroom and coming right back, you know, if you're gonna go get a cup of coffee, but the dog might need to go out or you might decide you need to change the laundry, you're gonna come back and this isn't covered, it's gonna be all icky. Missed it little piece of plastic wrap sitting there or aluminum foil or something just to cover it for that short time because five minutes can very easily turn into 20 or 30 minutes. It will save your paint. This little, what, 99 cent bottle will save a whole lot of stuff with acrylics. So mist, mist, mist. I think that's the number one thing people don't think to do. Yeah. And, and don't, you know, I, and if there's people like, well, but I only have a little paper plate and I'm only putting these colors out. You still waste. I've seen so many people that are like, then they throw the plate away and then they get more and then they get more. And it's like, how many plates did you just waste with those colors that with not misting, not to mention you're going through a bunch of paper plates. It's not good for the environment. This is going to be here, you know, just missed it. Missed, missed the bottle. Okay questions and then we're wrapping this up you know i do <laughs> how do you clean mold on a palette you get rid of all the paint <laughs> you get rid of all the paint and then you soak the palette and get and get rid of all you know scrape it off do not anytime a paint is molding it's pro probably because you use city water or well water or whatever you throw all that away because that's or you maybe left a sponge in there too Yes, I yeah, I don't ever use a sponge. I refuse to. I just ugh. if you do use a sponge, you just have to rinse Switch it out. Yeah. Yes. And use the distilled water. Yeah. That's yes. the big part. What are your thoughts on using dove soap to clean brushes and also Murphy's oil soap? Um, I would use the dove soap only on um synthetic acrylic brushes. And even then, only if you have to to really get stubborn residue. Um, just because it will with the bristles. Murphy's oil soap in a pinch for doing oil brushes. I don't know if I would necessarily use that with acrylic brushes because I can't remember what kind of oil it is. It's not linseed though, I don't think. So, um, but I mean, that's it, that's similar to the Jax. Mm -hmm. and, and it's something where if that's what you've got at the house and you're painting and you're out or you've forgotten to order it or whatever, better than nothing. Other questions? Well, she stole one of mine. Oh, Amanda. But will putting your palette in the freezer damage the paint? No, 
Okay, with acrylics, don't do this at all, okay? Acrylic paint, we get people that call all the time, and that's another thing as an acrylic painter, and it almost made the list, but it's so far down the list because this was just a beginner list. If you're an acrylic painter and you live in, say, Idaho or Wyoming or somewhere nowhere near an art store and you're ordering paint in the dead of winter when UPS trucks are getting stranded and there's your paint's gonna be in several freeze-thaw cycles, don't order your acrylic paint then. Don't, because acrylic paint isn't made to go through freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing. It's not made to do that. Some brands don't even handle it one time. A lot of the European brands don't at all. Um, I can think of Old Holland. We got some in that from somebody who lived out in the sticks and literally their package had been on a truck for like three weeks because it had been just snow jacked essentially and it was like squirting colored cottage cheese out of that's what happens if you get an acrylic tube of paint and you're squirting it out and it's just coming out as this like frothy gloopy yes thank you we get it <laughs> that's that's what's happened to it it's not a defective tube per se it's that it's either come to you in bad weather or it endured it somewhere where it had a free uh, you know multiple freeze thaw cycles some brands of paint chemically are designed to be able to manage those. I think Golden says it'll do up to seven or eight. I can't remember which, but that doesn't mean, oh, hey, you know, it could be three weeks before it gets here and it'll get snow jacked. Still don't use common sense. Don't do that, but don't put your acrylic paint in the freezer. And you know what? I still wouldn't do it with oil paint. It's not designed to do that. Use less. If you have so much paint on your palette where you have to put it in the freezer for a while, you need to get in the habit of using less paint and applying it more to your palette. Okay, you can always Just, put more on your palette. Yes, yeah. But once it's out, it's not going back no. in. No. Yes. One of our users has been a little thrown off by the don't water down your paint versus mist it with water to keep it moist. Can That's you... different, okay. So if I've got, you saw our blob of... Oh, Lord. Uh, okay, blob of blob of acrylic paint on your palette liquid I know it's fine <laughs> okay and this is a thinner no this is the look uh, the studio okay. not the fluid okay <laughs> good for that this isn't the same thing doing this that's all I'm saying I'm not saying drown it yeah I'm not saying it needs a life preserver and it's saying help help you're keeping the Rescue skin me. from forming on the surface. All I've done, yes, is just very light, and, and there's moisture around it, so the edge isn't gonna start drying out. I'm not just putting it on, and I'm not putting it on here and soaking it. If you're doing this, where the color is coming away, you're putting too much on there. That is wet enough, you don't need that. It's different to do that, then here's my water over here. Find a brush. Um, where'd my water go? This would be acceptable. See how this is too thin? That color just disappeared. I can see the gray through it. That is brushable. Let's see how much thicker that is. You can see a little bit of peak and brush stroke with it. That is uh, That would be still fine for doing a painting and applying to a painting where it's still gonna bond decently. If I'm doing this and adding more water See how thin that's getting? You can really see that gray through. This is where a gray palette is really helpful. That's probably a little too, even though this is made a peak, it's still very squishy. It's very wet. That's wringing it out. That's too wet, probably. Yeah. They're not watercolors. No. If you want it to be thinner like that, where you want it to be more fluid, there are fluid watercolors. There's liquid watercolors, which already come with more clear resin in it where it's more fluid. Do you want to show them like the golden high flow real quick? Yes, that? okay, so this is, this is just, this is, that's Lucas's medium body. This is Lucas liquid. Okay, so you can see that's already brush more brushable. That's brushable right there. You don't need to add water to it. There are fluid resins in it. Then here's Golden's um, high flow. Yeah, I couldn't think of the word. Okay. It's like ink. Yeah. That's acrylic still. It's got acrylic. See? See how I did that? Now that wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able to use, that wouldn't 
do, unless that was on watercolor paper where it was soaking in and leaving the color, that wouldn't work. Okay, does that make sense? Even if you use something like this and you wanna put it in an airbrush and you wanna thin the color so it's transparent, you need to put another resin in with this that's made for airbrushes to keep that acrylic amount higher so that it will stick to whatever it is you've got. Okay, does that make sense? Oh, breaking down the bonds of the paint, not yes. thinning down the bonds, thinning down the paint. Right, exactly. Okay, all right, more questions? Or are we good? If there's other questions, we will, I will come back and answer them. I'm multiple weeks behind at this point because we've just had so much going on in the studio with filming and other things. Um, but uh, I usually go back several weeks after the fact and answer any questions that maybe we didn't get to during the episode. Or you can feel free to follow my artist page on, on um, Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> I'm so tired. <laughs> um, it's at J Artorama. You can private message me there with questions and I will answer them. It doesn't need to be where you're asking me 20 questions a day. That starts becoming a little difficult because it is my artist page, not my, not something that I'm doing for work, but I'm happy to help people with that. Well, and customer service can always help too. Yes. And always look at the episodes that we've had. Chances are we may have hit on I mean, look at all the ones that were that had to do with today's episode in one way, shape, or form, and we've had 70 episodes, so yes. Do you have any quick tips for painting on glass? Acrylic on painting glass. on glass, usually you're going to have to use a glass primer with acrylic. That's something, or, glass or a glass paint. paint specifically, which is usually going to be solvent-based to bite into that glass. That's something where you need to investigate paints specifically for glass or look at primers that are designed for acrylic to stick on it because they will come off. It's, it's a slick surface that's a closed pore and then you're putting something on it that like we've said, acrylic is very soft and you know if you can peel it off a plastic palette, what are you gonna be able to do with something that's a harder surface? You're gonna be able to go right off. Yes, ladies, any other questions? Painting on rock? I thought we already talked about that. <laughs> you can paint directly on a rock. Do you need to you, prime it or anything? You could if you wanted. The only, t the only time I would say, okay, this is gonna sound really odd, but it's because I know a lot about rocks and it, I'm not even gonna explain why. Mm -hmm. There are certain rocks that have higher levels of sulfur or other gases in the rock that are more porous that could potentially discolor your paint. So research what kind of rock it is if you know. You well, may need to prime it then to, so that you don't yeah. have discoloration. Sometimes those shiny river rocks too, that they've polished to a high shine, will will do the same thing as like glass. You can peel it right off if it's super mm -hmm. shiny. So if it's just a rock rock you pick up mm -hmm. on the ground, like I know a lot of people are doing those um, granite rocks and hide them. And yeah, yeah, like yeah, out, yeah. Be fine too. Granite stuff like that. It's when you're talking about limestone based yeah. uh, or sedimentary rocks that you get a lot of gases in them, yeah. which I. Again, don't, you, um, we're not going to go into why I know that stuff. Yeah, too much science. All right, poor Amanda's so tired. You guys have worn them out. Thank you. It's like, it's like, it's like toddlers that, that need to be exercised. There were lots of here for 11 hours I, I know, today. I know, I know, I'm, I'm teasing. Well, yes, there they're already asking for, for what? They're already asking for 15 mistakes in oil painting. Yeah. I think you've started a series here. Okay. Today. Well, we're gonna we'll, we'll get to some of those. We're also going to have uh, coming up before the end of this year a beginner watercolors kind of like okay, you've got your first watercolors. What do you do now? What do you do now? How do you paint them? How do you apply them? What kind of paper do you use? And then it just got happy again. Basic techniques. <laughs> And then we're gonna also have a basic pastels lesson right before the framing pastels and charcoal episode. So then we will have something that we did from on the show to actually frame. Yeah. So a lot of people ask me about the, the batter valine things with the oils. Do you have something for them? Yeah, coming well, up? We've, had, we've had other things and there's artist problems on yeah. those too. She posted a link to it. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, that's something that, that we can do too. For this year, through the end of November, we take December off to plan for the next year. We already have all of our episodes booked with guests, with different 
things, everything is already all taken care of, but definitely keep the, the recommendations, the requests, all that coming because that helps for planning for next year. It'd be fantastic to be able to go into December and go, look at all these suggestions, yep. boop, 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 plug them all in and not have to think about it beyond December. That is like a pipe dream that'll never happen probably, but it's my pipe dream. <laughs> all right, okay, so everybody remembers about the shirts. If you didn't see it, just watch the very beginning. Um, we've got a new I'm Not a Robot campaign. You get a great t-shirt uh, like this one with a $50 or more order for free. Otherwise you can add it on for $10 and you can enter contests to be able to win $100 your gift cards. $100, $100 goes a long way. It is one... I can find some stuff I like for that. Yeah. Free shirt per person. I yes, sure that. yes, I did say that at the beginning, okay. but yes, one free shirt per portion. Per customer, not per order. Yeah. And that you can customize how, however you like. I know it seems a little trite that says artist. It's my foreign language skill, Katie. <laughs> um, so, and again, leave any questions after the fact, after the show is not live anymore. With YouTube, it's very difficult for us to do that, so I'll just have to put answers in the comments section yeah. for people because I can't leave it per their actual questions. Hopefully we got to everybody since it's can, slower traffic. I, I have a theory that you can tag the username when you okay. leave it. Maybe, yeah. All right. So just can't, can't, you let can't me know. put it right below the actual right. comment. Yes. It has to be in a different section. Yes. Okay. Uh, but hopefully we probably got all those answered while we were, Try since it was, yeah. okay. Um, and um, again, questions, follow me on Facebook, Amy Gardner Dean, or at J Artorama. I'm there for questions. I also post pictures we do during the week and cool stuff that we do around here. And have a good evening.